Hello everyone, here is our energy lesson number one. Um, we're going to introduce the general idea of energy. We'll talk about how we are going to use it in our class, how we're going to address certain problems, and essentially look at all the formulas and equations that come with it uh, on one hand. And then on the other hand, I just want to introduce the bigger picture. Um, you know, I like to do that sometimes and just think more philosophically, and that would be asking ourselves a question um, that is, what is energy? Um, and, and that will be a little bit more of a deep thinking question, but don't panic. Uh, there won't be any questions on that on the test. So to start with, uh, let's just think about probably the two most popular um, obvious energy types that we have. Um, and we'll just, we'll just do this qualitatively before we get into some specific equations. Um, and we can think about this with regards to a skateboarder. And we've got this simulation here that we'll be uh, playing in class a little bit. Uh, but you've probably come across these ideas before. Um, you can see it on the, on the simulation here. We've got kinetic energy and we've got potential, or as we're going to call it, gravitational potential energy. And then I've taken thermal away. Um, that means essentially that there's going to be no friction in this system. So it's a perfect system. And then obviously we keep track of the total. And the weird thing is, as we'll find, is that conservation of energy as a rule is really just kind of a bookkeeping method. It's a way of keeping track of the numbers before, during and after some sort of um, event. In this case, the event is going to be this skateboarder starting at the top of the ramp, uh, moving all the way down to the bottom of the ramp and then up to the other side of the ramp. So if we think about the situation to start with, um, we're going we're gonna to say that the skateboarder starts with a, a speed of zero. And that would mean the kinetic energy at the very beginning, the zero position, the kinetic energy would also be zero. <clears throat> and you can see that on the graph. However, they are starting at a certain distance away from the ground. Let's call this a height. And that means there is some gravitational, gravitational potential energy. In other words, the object at a certain height above the surface will have a tendency to accelerate down. That is a force. And as we're going to find out, force acting over a distance is a type of energy. So as the object falls down, it, it, it begins with its uh, maximum gravitational potential energy, and then at the very bottom, it, it has zero gravitational potential energy. And the idea here is that it converts from gravitational potential to kinetic. And you can see that in the graph. As the skateboarder is moving down the slope, you can see that, so as they're halfway down the slope, somewhere around this position here, you can see that the kinetic energy is building. In other words, the skateboarder is gradually increasing her speed and the potential gravitational potential energy is decreasing as the skateboarder de loses that height, they lose that gravitational potential energy. Of course, once they get to the bottom, they will have zero gravitational potential energy and the maximum amount of kinetic energy. So here we can see at this position here, they have zero uh, potential because they're at the bottom of the height and maximum kinetic energy. Notice, noticing also that the total energy stays the same since nothing is, there's no forces entering or leaving this system. In other words, there's no friction. That means there's no thermal energy and so the total energy always stays the same. This is a perfect conservation of energy scenario, albeit slightly, uh, slightly convoluted, but never mind. So skateboarder then continues up the other side of the ramp. And as they move up the ramp, they're going to slow down. They're going to decrease their speed, which means that kinetic energy is going to decrease. But of course, they're gaining height. So the gravitational potential energy is going to increase. And as they gradually reach the very top, it, they, will, they will reach a zero velocity once more, which would be the maximum gravitational potential energy 
and the whole system sort of reverses back to the beginning again. So that's the kind of qualitative thinking we're going to be going through. This is a particular example where there's potential energy and kinetic energy. Throughout these lessons, we'll come across um, spring energy as well. And later in the course, we'll be doing a lot more work on gravitational potential, potential energy and electric potential energy, lots of different types. So this is the general idea, and we'll introduce some equations. Um, we'll be thinking in systems, and we'll be thinking about work being done on systems. But we also want to just spend a moment thinking about what actually energy is. Well, here's a little snapshot from the Richard Feynman lectures. Richard Feynman is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, essentially created uh, quantum electrodynamics, QED, um, and gave a whole series of very famous lectures. Um, it's a little bit outdated now, but his some, some of his quotes are, are still quite pertinent. I think this is one that's worth mentioning. Um, so we ask ourselves, what is energy? And it turns out that that's not an easy question to answer. Um, and energy is a weird thing. It's not actually a thing. There's no physical object that you can point to. Um, it's kind of this weird idea that we can keep track of numbers um, before and after some sort of interaction or event. And those numbers just seem to uh, be kept the same. Uh, Richard Feynman did this nice, uh, feel free to go and check this out, Richard Feynman did this nice analogy with blocks, um, like Lego blocks, and kids playing with Lego blocks, and some of them getting lost behind the sofa, some of them getting lost in various other places, but ultimately the number of blocks has to remain the same. And it's kind of the same thing with energy. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find them, sometimes you think it goes missing, but the, the energy is just being trans transferred from one type of energy to another. And sometimes it's not always easy to see. Uh, but this little green quote's worth mentioning. Uh, Richard Feynman says, it's important to realize that in physics, we don't actually have any knowledge of what energy is. We do not have a picture that energy comes in little blobs of a definite amount. And it is not that way. However, there are formulas for calculating some numerical quantity. And when we add it all together, it gives a number. And it's always the same number. It's an abstract thing. And it does not tell us about the mechanism or the reasons for these formulas. It just seems to be the way our universe is, is constructed. It seems to be baked into the laws of the universe. And that is deeply fascinating. But for now, let's turn our attention to some actual examples that will help you with various different scenarios. Okay, so we've sort of introduced the general ideas of energy. We've qualitatively described kinetic and potential, uh, or gravitational potential. And we've, we've satisfied our curiosity by asking what energy is. The answer is we don't really know. Turns out there are a, a bunch of ways we can actually analyze and keep track of this idea of energy. Um, and the first lesson of the seven is to do with this idea of work. And it's a nice little segue into energies because we've been doing a lot of work on, sorry, we've been doing a lot of class time, we're doing lessons on forces. And the idea of work in the physics sense is when a force acts over a distance. And it's probably worth just looking at the equation briefly and thinking about the system. So let's just, let's just think about this little box here. And if I draw a circle around it, let's see, let's make it a circle. If I draw a circle around this, let's call this the system. Hopefully you can see that the force is actually now leaving the system. There is a force that this vector arrow representing the force it leaves the system. And that means this system is not isolated. There's gonna be a change. There's a change in the energy happening if that's the way that I want to define my system. Also, it might be easier, I could think about my system as the whole thing. And that in this case, there is no force leaving the system because the force vector is actually with inside my system. So it's inside the system, which means I can now consider sort of this idea of um, energy in is equal to the energy out. 
or I can just go ahead and analyze whatever is going on in my system without having to think about changing energies. So what's going on inside this system? Well, the equation for work is quite simply F times D. However, it sort of depends on the motion of the object, as we'll see in some of these special cases. Um, force times distance is a type of energy. It's, a, it's work, which is energy. And you probably already know that energy is a joule. Okay, we'll see that in a second. Um, we'll talk about where joules come from in a moment as well. But let's just look at this equation here. There's some cosine theta stuff going on. And don't panic. This is really just because in this particular scenario, this box you can kind of imagine being on a surface. And if you apply the force at an angle, the box is still going to continue along horizontally along the surface. It's not going to be lifted up at all. And this means that the, um, the, the force that acts parallel to the motion is actually adjacent to the force being applied. And of course, if it's adjacent to the force being applied, then we're going to be using cosine because Sokatoa, that would be adjacent and the hypotenuse. And so there, hopefully you can see that the, the work is going to be force times distance parallel. And that force times distance parallel is the cosine theta function in this, in this triangle. So it's just a little shortcut to think about what happens when you push an object or pull an object and it moves in a direction that is not parallel to the force being applied. <clears throat> now, some terminology we've already come across. Um, work or energy is scalar. That means it has no direction, it has no direction. And the joule is a derived unit. It's not a fundamental unit. And you can think about it in different ways. In, in terms of energy, it's force, which is a Newton. So it's a Newton times a distance, which is a meter. And then if you think about what a, what a Newton is, because a Newton is also a derived unit, we're going to also say that a joule, if you think about, a, uh, think about a Newton, a Newton, well, that's F equals MA. So a Newton is mass times acceleration. So that's kilograms, meters per second squared. And then we have to times it by meters again. So that's a square there. So the fundamental units of energy are kilogram meter squared over second squared, which is kind of neat. And also worth mentioning that units are very important and you should always check your units and you can use unit analysis to check if you've done your algebra correctly. Okay, last couple of things to mention is that there are some weird special cases. Um, the force, when you're applying a force on an object, if it's in the same direction as the motion, so remembering that a force and a displacement are vectors, if they are in the same direction, then we can go ahead and say that this is a positive, a positive form of work. So this is a positive form of work because the applied force and the, and the displacement are in the same direction. Conversely, if they're in opposite directions, so in this case, the object is moving to the right of the page, but the force is opposing it. This would be quite a, a popular force of friction scenario. In this case, the work would be negative. Okay, so let's think about that, what that means for a second. In positive work, this would mean that you're gaining some energy, right? So if this object is moving this way and you're applying a force in the same direction, potentially it's going to speed up and that's going to increase your energy. In other words, add to the energy. In this scenario, if the object is moving to the right and you're applying a force, in this case it's friction, this is going to slow the object down. In other words, it's going to take away the, some of that kinetic energy. So that's why it's a negative. Uh, another interesting special case is when the force applied is perpendicular to the direction. So this is quite common if you are, for example, carrying, you've got your arms here, you're walking like this, you're carrying an object, you are walking this way, 
but you're neither lifting the object up or down. It might feel like you're doing some work. Certainly your biceps are going to get a bit of a workout if you're holding the object. But in physics terms, you are not applying a force in the direction of the motion. So technically, you are doing no work. All right, the moment you've all been waiting for, a worked example. So um, here we have a block on the surface of Earth. Um, looks like there's no friction, uh, but we do know that it's moving to the right at a constant speed. So it's moving at 6.2 meters per second this way. That's its direction of motion. And it does that uh, for 8.9 seconds. We need to determine how much work is done by force one, and then how much is work, work is done by force two. So really there's two big ideas at play here. Firstly, we, we can do some kinematics. So remember back to your kinematics equations and various um, physics principles around something moving. We first of all recognize that it is moving at a constant speed. So this is uniform motion. Uniform motion comes with a set of principles. And the good news is it's fairly straightforward in physics terms because if it's moving at a constant speed, then we can use a nice easy V is D over T. The second big idea is work. The idea that work is a force times a distance. But specifically, um, in this case, we need to know whether the force is parallel to the distance. So we might be using F D cosine theta, or we might be using uh, a negative F D, or we might be using a positive F D. These are all <coughs> variations on a theme. So let's look at the different forces. Okay, so because it's not accelerating, that means that my F net equation in the X direction has to equal the sum of all the forces, which is going to be F1 and F2, um, but it's going to be equal to zero because it is not accelerating. And if I treat the right side of the page to be uh, positive and the left side of the page to be negative, I can say that it's going to be F2 is the positive and then minus, well, in this case, I need to consider the X component of that force applied. And hopefully you can see that that there is F cosine theta. So it's going to be F1 cosine theta. And really, that's a long way of going to say that F2 is equal to F1 cosine 25. And F1 is 710, so 710 cosine 25. So that is 643 decimal four seven something something something. Keep all of those in there. Okay, so let's do F1 first of all. F1 is just here, and the x component of F1 is going to be the same value as this value that we just calculated here. And it's going in the left or the negative direction. So this is a, an example of negative work. I'm going to say that the work here is going to be equal to 643.47, keeping all those values in there. But this is a negative direction. It's a negative force. And then I'm going to times that by the distance. All right, well, what's the distance? Okay, well, remember, we had this concept to do with the kinematics. And so we know that the distance is VT. So let's figure that out. How far does it travel in that time? Well, D is going to be the velocity, which is 6.2, multiplied by the time, which is 8.9 seconds. So this object moves 55.18 meters. So that can come directly down into my equation here. Um, this is 55.18 meters. And so now I've got a negative work. This, this F1 is going to do work of a value that is, it is negative 
35, sorry, not 35 points, 35,506.67, that's in joules, so let's simplify that to three significant figures, so it's going to be three decimal five five times 10 to the four joules. So that's the negative work of force one. Um, hopefully, those of you that were paying attention recognize that this is really just another way of me writing this, um, this equation here, right? I've just, this is just Fd cosine theta. So this value is simply Fd cosine theta. I just did a little bit more analysis over here to get this Essentially, this is the Fd cosine theta that I just used. Okay, how do we get um, force 2? Well, force 2, as it turns out, is the same force, right? Because it's not accelerating, this F net tells me that it's not accelerating, and it tells me that the forces are equal in both directions. So now I just have to recognize that the work done by F2 is parallel and it is in the same direction. So it's simply F2 times the distance that it travels. And this is going to be positive work. So it's going to be 643.47, that's in Newtons, times the distance, which is the same distance, 55.18. And that means that the work done here is actually exactly the same as the, the negative work it's just a positive version of it. And so it's going to be positive 3.55 times 10 to the 4 joules. Okay, so our second example, a little bit more tricky. There's a few more things going on. The key to this one is recognizing that you have the skills. All of the previous stuff that we've done gives you the skills to get this correct. Um, <clears throat> big picture stuff, let's do a little diagram to start with and then we'll think about the big ideas and then we'll fill in the the details okay we've got a 17 kilogram box let's draw it here so its mass is 17 kilograms it's being pulled to the right so I'll do a little free body diagram here there's a force we'll call that the applied force and we're going to try and uh, figure out the work done by this force uh, we don't know what that is um, there is also another force going to the left. This is the frictional force. And this means that it's going to accelerate to the left as well. So this frictional force must be bigger than the force applied. So this is the force of friction. It's 120 newtons. So this object is, it's traveling to the left. Sorry, traveling to the right. It's got a velocity to the right, we know the initial velocity is nine meters per second. Um, it's traveling to the right, but it's accelerating to the left. So this frictional force is decelerating it. And that means in the future, the object is gonna be somewhere over here on the right side of the page with a, well, let's put that in as the final velocity. So it's gonna be the final velocity and that's going to be zero because it comes to rest it says that it comes to rest um, okay so we've got a frictional force decelerating it the acceleration is to the left we've got a force pulling it there and we've got a velocity initial and a velocity final so big picture thinking now let's just consider that we have kinematics so we have a uniform accelerated motion situation going on. We are gonna have uh, an initial, a final, an acceleration, a distance, and a time. Those are our five variables in uniform accelerated motion. We also have F nets. Um, we have F nets, so we can go, let's do this in blue. So we can do an F net expression that's the sum of all the forces. We're going to do that at some point. Uh, but we also have, as we've just learned, we also have this idea of work. Work being FD. 
So these three fundamental skills are going to come together to get the correct answer here. We're trying to find out the work done. So we're, we're ultimately trying to find out this uh, this work value here. So we can get we need we need the distance that it travels between the initial and the final velocity, and we also need the force. Hopefully, you can see that the distance is going to come by looking at the uniform accelerated motion and the force is going to come by doing an F net expression. Let's do that. All right, VI is 9, 9 meters per second. The VF is 0 and the acceleration is negative. Make sure you always remember that negative is to the right, positive, sorry, negative is to the left, positive is to the right, which means that the acceleration is negative 1.85 and now we've got our three our three variables that makes us happy because we can now solve for anything we want we're going to want the distance we want this d so that we can calculate the work so i'm not really bothered about time so i'm going to use an equation that does not have time that's going to be vf squared is vi squared plus 2a D. And so we get the distance to be 21.89189 dot dot dot, keeping all those decimals in my calculator. Um, so now I'm going to turn my attention to the F net. Um, F net here is not going to equal zero, so this is going to equal MA. And we know the mass, we know the acceleration already. Force one, well, that's my positive force, that's going to be the force applied. And then that's minus the force of friction, because the force of friction is going to the left. And so I get the mass times the negative acceleration to be negative 31.45 is equal to the force applied minus that 120 newtons of friction, which means the force applied is 88.55 newtons. Okay, now I can put them together. I've got the force and the distance. So then the work done by this force, well, the, let's just double check whether it's positive or negative for, uh, work. The force applied is going in the positive direction. Okay, the force applied is going in the positive direction. And even though it's accelerating to the left, we know that it has an initial velocity of positive 9 and it comes to rest. So the object is moving to the right. So the displacement is to the right. This is a positive displacement. And so this is going to be positive work done by this force applied. So let's go ahead and just plug those numbers in. We get 88.55 newtons times 21.89 meters. And that's going to give me 1938.5. So let's put that into significant digits. And I think I need three looking at the question. So one decimal nine four times 10 to the three joules. That is the answer. Okay, last example. Um, you will remember, hopefully, that when we look at graphs, there's two different things that we can do. We can either look at the slope of the graph, which is uh, the derivatives, or we can look at the areas between the um, the x0 line and the slope itself. In other words, the area between the line and the axis. And that would be the integral, and that's going to give us some information as well. So take a look at this kind of graph. Um, if you are measuring the force acting on something over a distance, okay, if, you've got the, if, you're, if you're looking at the distance it moves and you're measuring the, the, the force acting on it, you can look at the areas because, of course, the area of these um, of these shapes, in this case, it's a triangle. This area here is going to be so the area of a triangle is length times width divided by two. And if you look at the length, then the length is, let's just say it's newtons. And because that would be this way and the width would be the distance, which is meters. And we know that newtons times meters is a is work, and that's a joule. A key thing is to recognize that 
these values above the axis are going to be positive values. And of course, these areas under the axis are going to be negative forces. So this is going to be negative work. All right, here's our example. We have a changing force. Okay, the force uh, changes over this distance. And we're told that it's acting over nine centimeters. Now we just have to work out the area under this line and that will give us a positive work because this is a positive force. Hopefully you can see we're gonna to need to split this into a triangle. So let's do that here. Here's our triangle on the top, one triangle. So this is area, the red area. And then underneath we've got a rectangle and that's the green area. So green area, let's do that first. The green area is going to be, well, that's this is acting over well, the, the force, uh, the, the, the length of this rectangle, which is the force is two, but notice that it's two times 10 to the three. So it's two times 10 to the three Newtons multiplied by nine centimeters. Well, centimeters are times 10 to the negative two meters. And I've gone ahead and just finished off the, the arithmetic here. The red area, of course, is 4.5, which goes from here. So 2, 1, 2, 3, 4.5. And then we need to make sure we're dividing by 2 because it's a triangle. These are the two areas. They're both positive. And so we can just add them together and call it positive work to two significant figures because we're given two in the question. And that's it for work. See you next time.